In this video I've put together every piece of evidence I could to test many of MQA's marketing claims and see if it's something that audiophiles should want or avoid. I even got my own music published on Tidal in MQA just to prove to you how troublesome it really is. And I've discovered a few things along the way that indicate MQA has more problems than we originally thought. I did reach out to MQA whilst making this video in order to present the evidence that I'd collected and give them a chance to respond before the video went live. The first response I got was actually having all of my music removed from Tidal. The next day I received an email back from MQA and I'll discuss their response at the end of the video. MQA's marketing has been vague at best, and it's changed over the years. There's a lack of definitive evidence about it. Additionally, due to some only partially related information being released, such as the White Glove service correcting for recording gear imperfections, which has nothing to do with MQA's normal releases, lots of people have formed their own different ideas as to what MQA is, what it does, what it improves, and how it works. I will be sticking to MQA's own claims, the things they themselves say it does, and discussing obvious issues found in my testing that would relate to real-world use. Though if you do have any specific questions after, feel free to join my Discord, or my private Patreon chat if you're feeling supportive, and I'll do my best to answer any questions. If you're short on time and want a quick summary, this video will prove the following points. MQA is not lossless, MQA adds unwanted noise and distortion, even in silent portions of tracks. MQA is not usually sourced from a high resolution master. MQA and its MQA Studio Blue Light doesn't actually authenticate anything. And then I'll be discussing the various other issues discovered throughout my testing. If you want to skip to a particular section, there's timestamps on the screen, but if you want the full story, then grab a cup of tea, sit back and enjoy. So before we start, I want to make a few things clear. One. All of the evidence I gathered and all of the issues that I found were sent to MQA prior to this video going live so that they could address the concerns put forward. After I sent my email, they did make sure to swiftly get my tracks removed from Tidal and also spoke to the publisher I used to have them block me and remove all of my content. I acted in good faith to make sure that this video would be as fair as possible and give MQA a fair chance to respond, to talk to me and suggest alternative testing or explain why some of these issues are present. I didn't want this to be one-sided, I wanted to get their view. But unfortunately, for a company with nothing to hide, they are sure very keen on keeping information like what I'm about to show quiet. I still have the original and MQA files, so it doesn't stop me or others from testing. But I think it says a lot about MQA as a company. 2. This video is not an attack on any manufacturer that has incorporated MQA into their products, for reasons which will be discussed at the end of the video. This video is intended to inform you, the viewer, about the issues and false claims surrounding MQA, nothing else. There are a huge number of fantastic products which happen to have MQA support. This is about MQA specifically, not the products that support it. 3. Obviously this is going to be a controversial topic, and even if after watching this video you still think MQA is beneficial or preferable to native flack, then that's entirely up to you. Subjective preference is, well, subjective, and I'm not going to stop you liking what you like. Some people prefer DACs, amps, headphones, and speakers that provably distort more, and that's okay. Objective performance doesn't always align with subjective preference, but please do not leave abuse towards me or others simply because your opinion differs. I'm providing evidence that MQA's claims are not true, and if you disagree with the evidence provided, I would strongly encourage you to gather your own. The more information is available, the better, and so far, MQA themselves have provided almost none. We should be able to discuss these things in a level headed and constructive manner. Don't resort to internet bickering. So, what is MQA, and what does it claim to do? MQA is a music encoding format that promises to unlock every detail of the original master recording. It will deliver the absolute best possible listening experience, that is, provided you have a title subscription and pay for a DAC which has MQA support. This, they claim, allows you to unfold additional information hidden within MQA files. It enables the listener to position the instruments and performers to build a 3D sonic picture and it retains 100% of the original recording. The claim is that it takes original high resolution studio recordings and folds the information into a 44.1 kHz file by encoding what was the high frequency information down under the noise floor of the audible band. Theoretically, this can then be played back natively on a standard DAC with just the 20 Hz to 20 kHz information available, or it can be unfolded back to high resolution. The first unfold can be done in software taking the 44.1 kHz file to 88.2. Some devices, called renderers, can do the second and third unfolds once they've been fed information that has already been unfolded once by Tidal, for example. 
And some devices, called full decoders, can do all three unfolds internally, and MQA claims that this then reveals the original resolution, the original Studio Master. The problem is, it's nearly impossible to test whether any of this is true. MQA is proprietary and closed source. Unlike other formats such as MP3, DSD, or even FLAC, we can't encode music in MQA ourselves. We cannot use test files to find out what's really going on, and as they go to great lengths to ensure that this is not possible, it's exceptionally difficult to test anything. No device with a digital output is allowed to have full MQA unfolding capability. It is only in DAX with an analog output, meaning it's impossible to test if unfolded MQA really is the same as native high res because we cannot get a true digital unfold and check it against the original. There are a lot of factors that MQA have put in place to make it very difficult to test claims and figure out what's going on. So, in order to look deep at what MQA is doing in various situations, I needed a track where both the real original master and the MQA versions were available. And so what better way to do that and be 100% certain than to get something published myself? I wanted not just to publish music though, I wanted to get some test files encoded, such as a 1kHz tone or an impulse response test. When I first attempted to do this, I was told by the publisher that the MQA encoder was unable to encode the file. How convenient, it seems that MQA's got checks in place to prevent anyone from getting test signals encoded. So I put together a quick acoustic track, and just so happened to put an impulse response white noise square wave 32 tone test, and the entire Rightmark Audio Analyzer test sequence inside of it for good measure. Not only did I publish a 44.1 kHz version, I also put together and published an 88.2 kHz high res version with a few extra tricks hidden inside, including some test tones at 35 kHz and 40 kHz, and full range sweeps going from 20 Hz to 44 kHz to test if MQA truly does retain all high res information from the original master once it's unfolded, or if it gets removed in the compression process. First, let's check to see if the MQA encoded 44.1 kHz file is the same as a native 44.1 kHz FLAC. I checked my master against the file on Deezer, and it was absolutely 100% bit perfect. It was the same file. On Tidal though, my MQA version was not the same. The MQA encoding process had altered it. Immediately, the waveform looks different. Transients are overshooting, giving the impression of it being louder at some points. And there is more high frequency noise compared to the original, even in what should have been silent portions of the track. Looking in at the impulse response inside the file, this showed a minimum phase ringing pattern, which also did not decay linearly. Minimum phase filters have the advantage of not having any pre-ringing, which means that transients can sound snappier or faster. However, it has the disadvantage that different frequencies move through the filter at different speeds, and this can throw off musical elements that rely on multiple frequencies at the same time, such as timbre. Once unfolded, this problem only got worse. The only way I was able to correct it was by running the track through HQ Player's PolySync MQA filter, which is designed to remove some of the anomalies and noise caused by MQA, and it did a pretty good job here. Quite why impulses and transients are behaving like this, I don't know. For my 88.2 kHz track, labelled as Deluxe, the Deezer version was just downsampled to 44.1 kHz, and otherwise looked good. Any high frequency content was just cut off, the impulse response preserved phase, and there was no added noise. Fantastic. However, the Tidal MQA version looked very messy. There was a lot of high frequency noise, again, even in parts of the track that was supposed to be completely silent. Also, content that was previously in the above 22 kHz range had been aliased or reflected back down into the audible band, and more on this later. So no, MQA files are not lossless, regardless of the original sample rate and if no MQA DAC or unfolding is used, they will present issues compared to streaming the lossless flag. I had a hunch that the amount of noise in this 25kHz band that was added was proportional to the amount of ultrasonic content that MQA had to reconstruct. My file has quite a lot of noise in this 25kHz band, but then my file also does have full range white noise in the original 88.2kHz master. To test this I did prepare another 88.2kHz master without the white noise and with the ultrasonic content drastically cut down. I'd submitted this to the publisher, but unfortunately before it went live, MQA had censored and removed all of my content from Tidal, so I wasn't able to confirm this. The reason that I suspected this though was because there was one track which I found where there was a native 88.2 kHz version available, and an MQA version which was sourced from an 88.2 kHz master. Sam Smith, too good at goodbyes. In the 44.1 kHz MQA version of the file, which was made from an 88.2 kHz master, 
We don't see the same band of high frequency noise like we did in my file. However, looking at the original native 88.2 kHz version, there was never any content above 22 kHz anyway. So this then suggests that the amount of noise that MQA adds is proportional to the amount of ultrasonic content that MQA has to reconstruct. Additionally, one interesting thing was that when these two files are compared using delta wave, firstly we can see that there is still some high frequency noise that MQA has added, it's not lossless at all, but there is also this strange band of distortion or difference across the entire track well within the audible band. This wasn't present on my file, I don't know what's causing this, but I felt that it was important to mention. So for 44.1 kHz masters, or high res masters where the ultrasonic content was cut anyway, there won't be that much noise, but still some. However, for a track like this, where there is content going all the way up to 44 kHz, there is a huge band of noise across the entire track, not just where that ultrasonic content was. This is still a big problem. MQA or any method aimed at high fidelity shouldn't be adding noise. The fact that this noise is present, and especially the fact that it's present across the entire file, is worrying. And it seems to be that MQA gets more noisy the more high frequency content MQA tries to reconstruct. Other issues were present in both the 88.2 and 44.1 kHz versions. Low level signals were handled very poorly, and dynamic range is reduced. My original included a minus 60 dB 1 kHz sign, which is the standard test signal for dynamic range. The original had no noise whatsoever and was restricted only by the FFT gain. In the MQA file, there was high frequency noise about 45 dB below the signal level, and noise throughout the spectrum about 65 dB below. In the MQA file produced from our high res master, this high frequency noise was actually 20 dB above the signal level. Next, let's look at exactly what's going on when unfolding. Does unfolding fix the issues and truly reveal the original master as MQA claims? Does it retain 100% of the original recording? The first thing I found was curious was that even my 44.1 kHz track authenticated as MQA Studio, and the DAC unfolded it to a 352.8 kHz sample rate. There was never a high resolution master. There is no extra information being retrieved here. It is just being upsampled. There are also no indicators on title that my tracks came from different sample rates. How are customers supposed to know which MQA releases are actually high resolution and which are just being upsampled? And if it is a 44.1 kHz original, why would you want the MQA version when all it's doing is adding noise and other unwanted effects compared to playing lossless? More concerning still, Tidal actually didn't serve the lossless file when I selected the hi-fi quality setting. It just streamed the MQA file without unfolding it. I personally paid for Tidal so that I could stream lossless, and if Tidal no longer offers that, at least for tracks labelled as master, I'm going to cancel my subscription, and I would encourage others to do the same. Even if MQA is a benefit in some cases, it should be a choice, it should not be mandatory. Speak with your wallet and demand lossless. A further note on this, my original 44.1 kHz master was 30 MB, and the MQA version is 33. It is bigger and does not offer a size advantage. The artist Neil Young actually removed all of his music at one point from Tidal in protest, after they provided MQA high-res releases, despite the fact that he had never given them permission to do so, and had never provided them with anything other than a 44.1 kHz master. In his own words, Tidal's master is a degradation of the original to make it fit in a box that collects royalties. That money is ultimately paid by the listeners. I am not behind it. I am out of there. Gone. My masters are the original. Now then, let's talk about authentication, that little blue light. It means nothing and MQA's provenance and authentication is not secure. User Frederick V on audio file style was able to get rid of over 30% of the file, truncating 30% of the bits, and that blue light still showed up. And here with my tracks, even though I only ever provided them a 44.1 kHz master, and the release on Tidal is not the same as my original master, this light is still showing up. This track has been altered, and so I, the artist, am telling you, this is not the version that would have been created or heard in the studio, nor is it truly high resolution. This blue light is MQA's marketing, nothing more. So then, let's have a look at unfolding. Once the track that was originally a 44.1 kHz master is unfolded through Tidal or Rune, an 88.2 kHz file is produced. Looking at the spectrum, we can see that there is an upwards reflection of the music when looking at the 44.1 kHz original. This was never there in the original master, 
it is an unwanted artifact. This is due to the upsampling filter that MQA uses being leaky, an issue which has actually been discussed by Arshimago in an article linked in the description and in a 2018 RMAF talk by Chris Conacher. There were MQA staff present for this, by the way, but they didn't offer any explanation. Instead, they chose to interrupt Chris quite regularly to make arguments that he should ask DAC manufacturer DCS why they support MQA, and that the information couldn't be trusted given as he wouldn't share the name of Arshimago, who had provided the graph. To address that second point, Chris quite rightly said that it didn't matter who Arshimago was. Anyone can quite easily show this imaging issue at home, and if you'd like to replicate this issue yourself, I've made a post showing quite easily how to do just that. Using the white noise portion of my track, I was able to look at the ultrasonic attenuation performance and filter design of MQA's unfolding filter. The white line here shows MQA's filter, and the blue line shows HQ Player's Sync L filter as an ideal reference. This is a 2 million tap filter, similar in design to that of the Chord M scaler, if you're familiar with that. MQA's filter has really poor attenuation, as well as strange patterns in the ultrasonic range. This is why ultrasonic content's being added. In the unfolded 44.1 kHz version, not only is the unwanted ultrasonic content added, audible band content hasn't been fixed either. There's still persistent high frequency noise, the square wave has excessive overshoot, nonlinear ringing, and a strange notch to the transitions. There's absolutely nothing I can see here that is in any way beneficial to the listener or the integrity of the song, and plenty that would be considered problematic. If we do a full decode, these problems are effectively repeated, with more upward images created. This part, for example, is a 20 Hz to 20 kHz sweep, and this musical content stopped at 22 kHz. There should be absolutely nothing above that, but the leaky upsampling filter design is introducing artifacts. That strange notch on the square wave is now extending lower, the 44.1 kHz master has gained nothing from this unfolding process, and it's had all sorts of problems added. So, what about the versions that did come from a high res release, the ones that were 88.2 kHz? In the original file for the 88.2 kHz release, I added a 35 kHz and 40 kHz test tone. These are frequencies which are too high to be stored in a 44.1 kHz file, and so this was designed to test whether MQA would retrieve this information once it was unfolded. The Rightmark Audio Analyzer test also has sweeps and IMD tests, which go all the way up to 44 kHz. In the MQA encoded 44.1 kHz file, these signs have been aliased down into the audible band at 9.1 and 4.1 kHz. These are not below the noise floor, these are very audible and have barely been attenuated at all. The same has happened for the sign sweeps in the Rightmark Audio Analyzer test. Once the frequency reaches 22 kHz, it starts moving back down and aliases into the audible band again. Once the first unfold was done, however, these 35 and 40 kHz signs were back in their correct place, and the Rightmark Audio Analyzer sweeps had been flipped back indicating that MQA's claim of restoring high-frequency content is at least partially true. However, it is far from perfect. We still have a massive band of noise centered around 25 kHz, and the unfolding has left further artifacting in lower frequencies, resulting in a noise floor of about minus 60 dB. In MQA's Bob Talks blog, they claim that content is folded back into the region below minus 120 dB and should therefore be inaudible. We can see from my file that this claim is just not true. This has hardly been attenuated at all, and higher level signals would absolutely be audible. I checked this by just listening myself, and I could quite clearly hear these tones being played. So this means that we've got a very poor dynamic range in both the audible and the ultrasonic bands when MQA is unfolding ultrasonic content. Once a full decode was done, Again, these problems did not go away, and we simply see the content of the file reflected upwards multiple times into the ultrasonic range. So, to answer question number two, yes, technically MQA does put back high frequency content once unfolded. However, it does so with vastly reduced accuracy and dynamic range, introduces concerning levels of noise that do not go away once unfolded, and it leaves fairly high level noise and artifacts in the audible band when previously folded content is removed. It does not, by any stretch, retain 100% of the original recording, and this claim is false. It is also, in my own opinion, not exactly a huge achievement given as the 44.1 kHz file could be barely usable. All of this content has simply been aliased and reflected back down into the audible frequency range at high levels. It is not folded down at inaudible levels as claimed by MQA, 
and depending on how much high frequency content was originally present, it could be very audible and very problematic. So then, with the testing out of the way, let's quick fire some points that we now know. MQA is not lossless in either stock or unfolded form, regardless of the original file sample rate. Most MQA releases are just being upsampled and are not sourced from high resolution masters. MQA aliases high frequency content down into the audible range with minimal attenuation. MQA does put back high frequency content and removes most of the previously alias content when unfolded, but it leaves significant noise and distortion behind. Tidal no longer offers true lossless streaming for any track marked as master that I could find. You either have compressed or lossy MQA. The lossless flack is not available and you have to use an alternative service such as Cobuzz or Deezer. MQA authentication and the blue light gives absolutely no guarantee of source sample rate, file integrity, or lack of alteration, and it does not guarantee that the sound is the same as it was in the studio. If you are a Rune user, you can actually see what the original sample rate of an MQA release was. The last portion of the track description where it gives the MQA sample rate is the original master sample rate, so anything labeled as 44.1 kHz here is just being upsampled. MQA, like for like, offers no file size advantage and is actually bigger than 44.1 kHz FLAC, though it is smaller than high res FLAC. Now, with evidence and testing out of the way, I want to give my own opinions about the situation, MQA in general, and why I did this testing. The following is my own view, not necessarily fact. I'm an audiophile. I love the gear, I love the music, and I love when a technological advancement brings an improvement to our listening experience. But anyone in this hobby will happily tell you that there is a lot of snake oil about. There are plenty of products that promise a better experience and claim to be the best way of doing whatever it is they're doing, but there are two key categories. Those that have evidence or can be tested by a third party, and those that cannot. There are people like Rob Watts from Cord, who is quite vocal about the fact that he believes his WTA filter design is the optimal method for playing back 44.1 kHz audio, and not only is evidence given for this, you can test it yourself. I don't necessarily agree, but me or anyone with a Chord DAC or Chord M scaler is free to play and record any music we like through them, test any signals we wish, and Rob Watts is also very responsive on places such as HeadFi, writing up detailed posts about how and why his design works. He's not going to hand over the filter coefficients, but he'll answer enough questions and provide evidence for you to make an informed decision as to whether you agree and would like to purchase his product. It's a similar story with DSD. It's open. Anyone can encode and playback files using it, and it's completely able to be poked, prodded, tested, explored, and have the pros and cons discussed. Even the market segment most commonly regarded as being snake oil, cables, can be tested. When comparing the jitter performance between a decent generic BNC cable and the AudioQuest Carbon BNC cable, I was able to get measurably lower jitter with the AudioQuest cable. Now whether this is worth the cost or audible to you is a different question, but the point is I can test their marketing claims and I can prove or disprove them. But then there are companies like MQA. Not only has MQA not provided their own evidence, they prevent you from gathering your own. You can't encode files in MQA or record the final output of a full decoder. It just operates on a trust us it's better approach. Their marketing claims are vague and change when they get disproven. They've released information and done some things that are genuinely fascinating. MQA's white glove treatment, correcting for problems in recording equipment is truly fantastic and I would strongly recommend giving the Fairy Tales article a read, it's highly recommended. But, the way that it's presented makes people believe that this is how MQA's core product works, which it isn't. The implication is that all MQA releases are better than FLAC, when the majority of it is just upsampled 44.1. Bob Stewart's blog provides an explanation for how MQA folds high frequency info, which could never work with a 16-bit file as it wouldn't have enough dynamic range. When issues are presented to them, they dodge the question and try to divert the conversation. And all the while, more and more music content is being replaced with MQA, more and more hardware is supporting MQA, and it continues to spread, with the supposed benefits being completely unproven, and its problems steadily being exposed as people find ways around the testing roadblocks, such as what I've done today. Even if we were to assume that MQA is absolutely perfect, that it is 100% lossless, and it does everything as described in the marketing material, it should not be the only option. You should still have a choice. You should still be able to choose between high resolution native sample rate audio and MQA, as well as any other option that chooses to come along. Now, as I've shown in this video, 
most MQA releases are just being upsampled from 44.1 kHz. They are not sourced from a high resolution master. But there are some releases where it is genuinely from a high sample rate master and there is no native high sample rate release. This is a problem. You as a consumer should not be comfortable with one company growing a monopoly on the high resolution audio market. 24 bit 192 kilohertz audio uses less than five megabits per second. The vast majority of internet connections in the developed world can absolutely accommodate that. If you can watch YouTube or Netflix, you can stream lossless in 24 192 without any concern whatsoever. MQA is nothing but an expensive, lossy compression mechanism being forced on you and provided as the only option if you want to access some of this high resolution content. And even then, Due to the faults shown in this video, it is not the same as the native high res content. That ideal option of true native audio has been taken away from you. The reason hardware manufacturers are supporting MQA isn't because they genuinely think it works and that it's better than native high res. It's because you, the customer, are demanding it. Various companies such as Shit, Lin, and even PS Audio, whose DACs do support MQA, have all spoken out against MQA. Links again are in the description. Paul from PS Audio talks in a video about this. He says that MQA was added because so many people were demanding it, but he still doesn't like it. It's a business decision. It's being done because if they do not implement it, they will lose customers. And regardless of MQA's technical performance, no one can dispute that it is an absolutely fantastic example of the power of marketing. I like progress. I like advancements in allowing us to enjoy music all the more, but MQA has various demonstrable problems none of which exist if you just stream lossless flack, even at 44.1. I can't recommend that anyone uses MQA in any situation, and you should vote with your wallet. Don't buy products that have costly MQA licensing fees tacked on. Don't subscribe to platforms like Tidal that are removing lossless content and forcing you to use MQA for a lot of tracks. And demand that companies be honest and transparent about the products they sell. Demand that they allow third-party testing to confirm their marketing claims. If a company can't provide its own evidence and goes to great lengths to prevent anyone else from testing it, that should probably raise quite a few red flags. One last thing I'd like to talk about. The first unfold of MQA is different to the second and third, which is why some devices can only do the second and third and require the player software to do the first. If you have no choice but to use an MQA file, my recommendation would be to do the first unfold in software and then upsample or oversample normally with your internal DAC filter don't do any further MQA rendering. This will remove most of the audible band aliasing, but it will also remove unwanted high frequency images and some of the noise. During this video, I use the iFi iDSD Diablo for testing. It is a full MQA decoder, and I have to say, it's a fantastic product. I love it. But I did find out something kind of interesting about iFi's GTO filter whilst I was making this. This is the filter response of iFi's GTO filter. Look familiar? That's probably because this is the filter response of MQA's renderer filter. They are basically identical. A quick test showed that iFi's GTO filter exhibited the same leaky characteristics and caused imaging in the same way as the MQA unfolds did. And it's also minimum phase, meaning that phase dependent sound traits such as timbre can be degraded by using it. However, swapping back to the 7.0 firmware and using the stock filter was absolutely fine. I would strongly recommend that if you have an iFi DAC, you use the stock filter, not GTO. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised when I read the iFi paper about the GTO filter and saw that it was designed with assistance from MQA. The Diablo is still a truly fantastic product, and again, just because something supports MQA doesn't mean that the product is bad. But tell manufacturers you don't want to pay extra for it. Tell them that you want their products without MQA added on. MQA did respond to me prior to this video going live, I'm not going to address every single point because a lot of it is just marketing speak, but the full response is on screen now so you can read through, and the references are linked in the description. The first part mostly talks about how MQA is more advanced than conventional approaches and intends to account for the conversion process at each end of the chain. This makes no sense given as I got my files encoded in MQA and wasn't even asked for information whatsoever about the production hardware I used. This was all done using MQA's recommended method for indie artists, by the way. And all of the issues in this video were captured using fully certified MQA hardware and software. More to the point, even if you did have information about the source and DAC hardware components, 
How would you account for the behavior with tracks where multiple ADCs, synths, recording methods, and in-production editing methods were used? Hardly any music nowadays is produced in analog and then digitized, or digitally recorded using only one ADC model. We don't understand your frustration about evaluating MQA. My frustration is that no end-to-end -end analysis tools are available like they are for nearly every other format. Yes, we can listen to any MQA song, but we have no information about how it's been altered, we can't check for placebo, we don't know if it's the same master, and we have no way to objectively test with test tones or signals other than jumping through a lot of hoops like I had to do for this video. Additionally, when someone like Chris Conacher provides evidence, the question gets dodged and you try to change the subject. When I reach out to you, you attempt to censor me by removing all of my content. That is my frustration. It isn't transparent in the slightest, and MQA responds in a hostile manner whenever criticized. In regards to the tracks I had used for testing in this video, MQA says, this encoder is not configured to deal with content where, for example, the statistics change mid-song, or where the audio does not resemble natural sound. Does that then imply that electronic music won't work with MQA, or that tracks with a combination of natural recording and synthesized parts won't work? Right now, none of the tracks in Tidal's top 10 are true analog recordings, and yet 8 out of 10 of them are in MQA. Maybe the studio tools that are referenced in your response and on your website do help to overcome these issues. But again, there's no transparency. We have no idea what these tools are, who has access to them, which releases were made using them, and we have no way to evaluate them. Would you ever consider making a limited version of these available, perhaps releasing a version that only allows for a max 10 second audio length? This would allow people to test properly without having any commercial impact, and is similar to what Signalist does with their HQ player software where you can use the HQ Player professional software, but it caps the output to 60 seconds of audio. A little transparency would go a long way, and saying that MQA is lossless, but only within vague, unspecified criteria, and lossless only using non-conventional evaluation methods, isn't exactly reassuring. In regards to my mention of the blue MQA authentication indicator, they said, the onus is on the submitter to check the content when it arrives on Tidal, and confirm the sound. Again, this was never mentioned during the publishing process, it is not mentioned in your marketing material, and it also doesn't address the fact that you can make an MQA file, throw away a third of it, and still have that light show up. Plus, even the 44.1 kHz file that I submitted both sounds different and is objectively different to the master that I published. And again, this is the same for any other track where a high sample rate version and MQA version are available. They're not the same. The next part of their response goes on to explain how MQA adaptively identifies and responds to content in a track, which again implies that it can't be lossless. If it's behaving differently to different types of recording and music, then the result won't be consistent. It might sound more natural to some people, but sounding natural and being lossless to the original master are not the same thing. Now, they also discuss the files that I had published. I should firstly mention that the information and status messages they're providing here I only ever received one of these, the one saying that the encoder was unable to encode the file, and that was only for the files where it was literally just a test file, an impulse response or square wave without any other content, which likely wouldn't pass MQA's checks for test files. Other products like the Chord Mscaler have impulse test detection as well. All of the other error messages I never received. I don't know if these are genuine, and given as MQA had the publisher remove all of my content, I can't go back and check. In response to my claims about added noise, MQA claims that this was my fault, as I didn't dither the files, claiming this was a naive mistake. No MQA, it wasn't. In fact, this was something I had explicitly tested. The first track I submitted, called Try Again, did have dither, and it showed all of the issues mentioned in this video, in fact some to a worse extent. To give MQA the benefit of the doubt, and check that the dithering wasn't adversely affecting anything, I published the next two tracks without dither. So this isn't my fault at all, and the only naive mistake made was MQA not looking at all three files I had published. Dither was something I considered, and it was something that I checked if it altered MQA's performance. In response to others and my description of the MQA upsampling filters as leaky, they claim this term is derogatory and inappropriate, and that the only alternative would be brick wall band limiting. Firstly, I don't think the filter itself has feelings, but if I have hurt them, then I apologize. Secondly, Perhaps the biggest advantage of genuine native high-res audio is just this. It allows much more flexibility with the filter design. Going from 44.1 kHz 
to 96 kHz gives you over 13 times more distance between the audible band and the Nyquist frequency. So if the argument is that brick wall filters are bad, which to be clear, in many aspects I agree with, the solution isn't MQA, it's to use native high res In regards to aliasing, they claim that this is simply because the levels of the signal were too high and it wouldn't occur in real music. For this point, I'm quite happy to accept this might be the case. In fact, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I'd prepared another track with ultrasonic content at a much lower level to test what level this was then aliased down at. Unfortunately, you had my tracks removed and this never made it to Tidal. If this claim is true, then send me the MQA encoded version of that file, and I will put at the top of the description of this video that MQA does not actually have any issues with aliasing. Lastly, they say that despite what's shown here, MQA doesn't add distortion, and the noise added is inaudible high frequency dither noise. It might be centered on 25 kHz in the unfolded version, but in both the 44.1 and unfolded versions, it extends down into the audible band and is at minus 43 dB at 20 kHz. That is audible. They also say that every MQA file will tell you the original sample rate of the master. And this is true, but my complaint wasn't that it didn't tell you anywhere, it was that it wasn't clear in the slightest. Tidal shows no indication at all of original sample rate, you have to use a program like Rune to show this information. This means that MQA's marketing is misleading consumers into thinking that MQA releases are the same or better than 24-bit 192kHz FLAC. I did a survey which got over 240 responses. Of those people, 46% said that they thought MQA was a good thing. The people that said MQA was a good thing, two-thirds of them believed that MQA releases were the same or better than 24-bit 192kHz FLAC. This is why I think it's a problem. This is why it needs to be more transparent. Even if a 24-bit 192kHz recording folded down to 44.1kHz was absolutely identical to a native 192kHz recording, the vast number of MQA releases that are 44.1kHz from 44.1kHz masters are not the same or better than native high-res FLAC, and this misconception is concerning. Hopefully you found this video informative and enjoyable. I'd like to thank Daniel Mellinger and Amos, aka Kurawong, for helping me out with the making of this video. Amos has compiled a long list of interesting articles and evidence surrounding MQA, a lot of which was not touched on in this video, and all of them are in the description below. I'd also like to thank Arshimago, John Atkinson, Miska, Mans Rolgard, and Frederick V for the information, tools, and testing that they have made available. Thank you as well to all of the 250 people that responded to my MQA survey. Additionally, a huge thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Diamond and Legend tier patrons, Chris, Ross Kyle, Gravitas, Crack, Daniel Mellinger, King Jong Un, and Lana Bennett. You guys are fantastic. If you have any questions, do feel free to join my Discord or my private Telegram chat for patrons if you're feeling supportive. Have a great day.